Mike, why in the hell are we about to talk about a book that was written in 1974 called The Inner Game of Tennis? I do not play tennis. I don't believe you're playing tennis right now. Why would we choose to talk about this? Well, this book uh, was recommended to me by many people um, from completely different segments of my life, like with no connection to each other. Uh, and I at first thought that I don't, I don't want to read that. I don't really like self-help books very much. We've read a lot of them. They mostly are garbage. And here's just yet another one, as like you said, from a pretty obscure source, tennis coach from the 70s. But after enough recommendations said, okay, fine, I'll read it. I absolutely loved it. And I kept working it into our conversations over the previous few podcasts. And then you decided, I convinced you to read it and that I think you really liked it as well. So we just thought, okay, let's just talk about this book because it's just such a great book. To me, what's what's amazing about this particular book is that this tennis coach, um, he attempts to do something that we on this podcast value very highly, which is Tim Galway, the author, attempts to talk about something that is very nebulous and hard to talk about but and yet it is extremely important it's one of those it fits in that category of thing that we just don't talk about because it's weird and hard to formulate words and ideas around it's ephemeral it lives inside your mind but that does not mean that it isn't this utterly fundamental thing to the way we perform and, and approach things and he he just spends this whole book trying to do that. And the thing that he attempts to name and talk about is something that just really resonated with me and I think you as well. So like, that's why we want to talk about this. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved this book. Um, I, okay, not to put too much pressure on ourselves, but I, I think that this one topic, what he talks about might just be it's sort of the tip of the iceberg on the most interesting topic on planet earth <laughs> it's a bit bold but what he talks about with i don't know subconscious mind and what humans are capable of and i don't know i i find this extremely fascinating and i'm excited to talk about it okay all right so let's let's assume that 99.9% .9 of the audience has not read this book. And we'll assume that 99.6% of the audience will never read this book. I do highly recommend it. And it's actually, it's pretty short. It's a very easy read. So I highly recommend it. But I recognize that people recommend a lot of things and I don't take most of those recommendations. So let's just assume that most people aren't going to read this. Um, how would you, let's try to explain what, what is the core ideas to the book? What is Tim Galloway trying to get across? I'm going to ask you, how would you explain it? All right, fair enough. So the he kind of starts out, he, he, he narrates his trajectory as a tennis coach uh, and, and kind of puts this arc on it of how he comes to these realizations over time and everything. But he begins by talking about him being a coach and working with students. And he... He does what every coach does. And I've actually been a tennis coach for a short-ish period of time, like a year or so. Um, so I can relate to this in this exact context. But of course, I can relate to this like as being a piano teacher and a guitar teacher and whatnot. But he does what most coaches do, which is you have somebody who's trying to learn a forehand or something. And you watch them do it. And of course, it's not very good. And so you you tell them things. You say, well... Okay, start with your racket way up here. Bring your racket up high. And then they, they, you know, maybe they attempt to do that and it looks terrible and awkward. And you go, okay, well, all right. So, yeah, you have your racket high, but then, you know, bring it low and then bring it high again. Make like a like a U shape. And then, you know, watch the ball and, and you know, twist your feet. And you, you start giving them these very literal uh, verbal instructions of do this thing, do that thing. And typically what happens is the the person 
who's attempting to do this thing, in this case of forehand, they, they get worse and worse at the thing you're trying to make them better at. Uh, they become more and more self-aware. They tend to become more uh, tight and mechanical. And they're really doing the opposite of what you would see a really good tennis player doing, which is this very, this fluid, almost thoughtless motion, or, uh, motion uh, just kind of moving their racket comfortably through the ball and, and taking these these really nice swings. Like that's, you're, you're kind of pushing them in almost the exact opposite direction. Um, and typically what happens as this process goes on is, you know, the this person is, they're not doing well. And so in an attempt to fix that, you're telling them more things and that kind of makes them do worse. And you tell them more things and then you typically end with, okay, well, go practice those things. And then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll work on this next time. And usually the, the student feels a bit of guilt or a bit of inadequacy where they feel like they're just not, not really doing well. Um, you know, they, maybe they, they feel like there's some personal failure in, in the lesson and they feel like, oh, this, well, I have all this stuff to work on. You know, the coach is really good. They were able to point out 15 different things that were wrong with my swing and my movement. So, you know, they must really know what they're talking about. You know, I'm glad that I paid the money to do this, you know, tennis lesson or something. And that's kind of how it ends. Is that a fair characterization of like the default? Yeah. Yes, he uses the tennis teaching example as a way to kind of shed light on what he's going to talk about. But I have never taught tennis, so I'm sitting there very much um, agreeing or, or understanding or, or relating to exactly right. what the student is feeling. That yeah. feeling of frustration with not being able to, to do it well enough and... There's, there's plenty of moments when I'm, I'm drawing where I'm, I'm like trying to force all of these rules onto myself and it just gets worse and worse where it should be this very free flowing thing, mm -hmm. but all these little stupid rules just start, um, just clouding your brain. It's yeah. like, okay, here's an example. When I was a kid, I was probably like 12 years old or something. And we go to this, uh, skating rink or skating uh event. i don't know what it's called remember in the gymnasiums yeah, where yeah like a little roller skate thing yeah roller, roller skate whatever thing that i guess you do in the 90s but yeah i walk into this place and i think this was my first my first experience of uh social anxiety so i walk into this giant gymnasium just filled with people um with my friend so i'm walking in with my friend and this place is filled with people, you know, there's all these girls my age and, you know, I don't know, just everybody, it feels like everyone's just staring at me. And as me and my friend are walking across the entire gymnasium, I turn to him and I'm like, I don't know, I just, I felt so awkward. I was like, I think I forgot how to walk. And he's like, <laughs> well, you're walking. I'm like, yeah, but like, I don't remember how to walk. <laughs> and what was happening was that I was just paying so much attention to what I was doing. I like, it just felt wrong. Like I felt like everyone was staring and it. I was just so yeah. aware of everything I was doing. I couldn't just walk like an, I mean, I think I was walking like a normal person, but it just didn't feel right. It was so, it was awful. Um, and I think that in, in the teaching tennis example, where you got the student and the, the teacher uh, pointing out all of these issues, like, you know, don't do this, do that, whatever. It just kind of builds up and you stop feeling this natural feeling of, you know, mm -hmm. it should be way easier because your body already knows how to do it. But anyway, yeah. yes, I think that's a fair explanation of what he's talking about. Uh, well, another pretty common example. If you try to give a speech, right, this is... According to surveys, one of people's darkest fears is public speaking. Pretty often, someone will get up to give a speech or, or just a talk about something. Maybe it's something they're interested in, you know, something they've been working on or, I don't know, whatever. And despite being able, you know, if you met this person on the street and said, hey, what what is it you're working on? And they'd go, oh, this thing, that is super cool. And here's 
here's what it, what it is and how it works and they would like tell you all about it no problem you you put them up on this stage in front of people and suddenly they forget how to talk and without uh <laughs> diverting into the people suck at teaching rant which uh, well i want a different episode yeah yeah, yeah, yeah different episode <laughs> But you see this actually all the time, even with experienced teachers, they'll get up there to explain something or talk. And then for some very strange reason, the intonation of their words no longer works correctly. Like they'll intonate the wrong thing and act like the middle of a sentence for no reason is very important. Like they just have the weirdest style of speaking. And you can tell it's this persona that people put on or... or, or uh, in this original example somebody's just nervous and they just they're more aware of how they sound than what they're actually saying and they lose the ability to just string together logical sentences in the way that they do at every other moment of their life it's that same phenomenon of your mind just goes to this other place of hyper analysis and judgment and you just lose the ability to do the absolute simplest things that you have always been able to do at every moment of your life. You know how signing your name to something like your signature is really easy to do because you've done it a million times, right? Yeah. Well, just the other day, I don't know. It, I have to fill out this, this form at work and I have to sign my name at the end. And I'm like, Oh God, <laughs> how do I sign my name? And I, I had to practice it on a post-it note. Well, I, I mean, I just kind of did that habitually, like, oh, I'm too scared to, to sign the document. So let me practice my own signature on a post-it before I sign it. I'm like, that's the that's the thing. It's like your, your hyper awareness, like it has to yeah. be perfect. And therefore you suck at it. Like, right. Yeah. OK, so here's here's the important next question. Why would that happen? I mean, I've experienced the same thing or even worse trying not even my signature but just literally writing my own name i will misspell my own name sometimes usually when i'm extra worried about it and trying to be super careful like i've just finished filling out this big long important form and then i have to write my name and i'm like m a why does Make. that happen <laughs> yeah well i wish i could describe it the way he described it but We're, we're constantly doing so much. Like I've been breathing this whole time. I'm standing, like I'm, I'm balancing for the most part. You know, I'm moving my hands, you know. There's all kinds of things going on, but I'm not thinking about them at all. I'm just doing them. As soon as I start thinking about them, there's this different part of my brain, these different functions that start trying to take over. Um, well... He calls it, I don't, I don't know how to describe what he was describing because it's so weird. Yeah. Um, well, again, that's, but, okay. I think that's the value of the book is that he attempts to describe this thing that is very hard to describe. Okay. The reason why that would happen is because when you, when you focus on something, I mean, in this way where you're over aware of it or obsessing about it or trying to control it a different part of your brain than what should be controlling it is taking over. And that part of your brain doesn't really know how to do it. And it has, yeah. it's much slower than your natural responses. I don't know. How would you? No, I, I think you're exactly right. He gives the example of walking, which we actually talked about a couple of podcasts ago. I got on this weird, very passionate rant about how silly it would be if adults had to try to learn to walk. And that's, that's something from the book but with the example of walking the the thing that is actually happening is incredibly complex i mean boston dynamics has been working on robots that can do this for years and years with tons of money and it's still i mean it's impressive but it's still not even that great like they can't match what just about every single human on earth is able to do with walking it's super complex there's tons and tons of muscles there's so much subtlety and i mean you're you're not just repeating emotion you're sensing your environment and the ground and responding to tiny sensations in your feet and 
shifting your balance in subtle ways and firing different muscles. Like it's this wildly complex process. And if you try to explain it, if you imagine somebody who just got the plug ripped out and they came out of the matrix and they never walked before, you couldn't just tell them. You know, they're you you cannot put the complexity of walking into explicit statements of start with your right leg and tighten your quad and tighten your hip flexor by 20%. Like you, there's no way, not even close, right? Walking is what I, I'm afraid I'm going to call this the wrong thing. I think you would call it like innate knowledge or um, implicit knowledge or something like that. Like there's explicit things, things that you can you can speak you can say in logical terms and sequence like you could you could create a math proof uh you could prove the quadratic formula or something with explicit statements walking is not like that you you can't model that with simple english words walking is something that you could begin to learn by seeing you could see what other humans do uh, you would start to imitate you would have to gain feedback from your own body and start to let your your brainstem and muscles adapt to what's happening and just you have to learn it in this very non-explicit way and it's really obvious in the case of walking because everybody learns it when they're really young before they know how to speak so it, it's never unless in some unusual scenario maybe but for almost everyone it's never explained it's just something that we imitate and attempt and eventually learn how to do but it's it's innate knowledge it's it's stuff that exists in your body and it's made up of all these tiny sensations and reflexes and very complex movements that your mind kind of chunks together and, and learns to do unconsciously. I mean, you, you do not think about the way you walk unless you want to. You know, it's just all inside your head. And if you were to try and take over the process of walking with your conscious mind, you can't do it. Like, it does not exist there your conscious logical mind does not have anywhere near the necessary resolution or, or ability to do that kind of thing. So walking, it just, we do it all the time and we don't think about it. But if you were to try and think about it, you that part of your brain can't handle it. And it's the same thing with almost any of these, you know, writing your name, right? I, I don't have this logical sequence of move the pen by this much in this direction at this right. speed and then decelerate as I approach the peak of the M and then move it back down. But like that, it does not exist in my conscious brain. It exists as this, it's this motion that I know and I can call it up with my conscious brain and say, hey, inner self, write your name right now. But the actual motions are entirely unconscious. Which is so weird. I mean, you have that knowledge, but you cannot see it. It is completely invisible to you, yet it's available. Yeah. That's really weird. Um, okay, so he, we've started to define these two different areas of the brain or ways of thinking. He calls it self one, which is that conscious part of your brain although it's a little i think it's a little bit more than just conscious and subconscious but he calls it self one and then self two is that sort of invisible knowledge the so the second part of you that can do these things but you can't really explain it my biggest problem with the book which is not that big but this is my biggest problem is that the names self one and self two are stupid he should not have called it self one and self two because i spent half okay. the book trying to remember which one is which they're, they're not very memorable uh yeah you know, you'd say I self... actually okay you disagree. disagree well go ahead finish here why not call stand. it the inner self and the outer self if it's the inner game of tennis why wouldn't you just name it the inner self instead of having to make your reader remember whether self one is the the cool inside one or <laughs> self two is the cool inside one like i just i kept getting hung up on that all right, well, maybe maybe he could have called it the inner and outer, whatever, and that would have been fine. But the way I was thinking about it is that it was really cool that he didn't just say it was conscious and subconscious. He gave you these two blank names that don't really have any connotation to them, self-one and self-two. And then he lets, like, through 
through examples and some explanation, he lets you form your own mental image of what self one is and what self two is based on your own experience. I don't know if he did this intentionally, but I think I was finding this is how it works. Because if I think, if he said conscious and subconscious, I already have these preconceived ideas of what those are. But if you say self one and self two, and then you have to kind of create what those mean to you from the examples that are given and through your own experience, you gain sort of a better understanding of, of what they actually are. Maybe that was just me reading too far into things, but <laughs> I, that's, that's fair for me. I just spent half the book trying to remember which one was, which, oh, so it was hard for me problem. to, all right, well, good for you. You're very smart. But, but anyway, do you want to continue calling them self one and self two or should we? No, that's fine. We'll stick with what the book said. Just <laughs> self two is the inside one yes. that's not conscious. And then self one is the logical conscious thinks in words type of self. Yeah. So just, just go in order. The top thing of a person is their head, like their consciousness, self one. So it goes one, two. Self, yeah, sure. Not one, it, it feels arbitrary. Okay, let's move on past this. Yeah, okay. So, uh, all right. This is how he sets it up. And despite, I don't love the names, but it's a, it's a great way of, uh, it, it's a, it's a good thing to start like holding on to. Like you can, you can picture this concept and you can start reasoning about it. Like we've said a million times, if you, if you give something a name, even if it's a dumb name, you now have a handle for that thing. You can start talking about it and thinking about it. And in this case, it's a weird thing that's not, not talked about very often. It's really vital. And that's his way of presenting it. So getting back to the why, that's kind of how I see it here is that very often there are things that self two, the inner self, uh, has to do. It has to because... To just like riding a bicycle. There was actually a, a research paper published recently about how you can't really teach somebody to ride a bike in literal terms. You can't explain it to them because it's actually this really weird effect of a gyroscope and the, the motion of your body is very strange. Like it's not something that you can explain. You, it, it's not explicit knowledge. It's intrinsic knowledge, something that you just feel and learn and become comfortable with. So you can't do it that way. So self too has to be the one riding a bicycle and if you try to do it with self one if you try to logic your way through it it doesn't work it just it can't work your your conscious logical self is not capable of doing that sort of thing but the problem comes when we're it, it can happen when we're trying to transfer knowledge from one person to another uh, but it can also happen just like you said just with yourself like it's, it does not need to be a teacher student scenario it can be a, yourself trying to teach yourself how to learn something you hop on a bike for the first time your mind is not going to be this blank quiet place it's you're going to be constantly thinking and judging oh i did this i gotta do that and oh, i'm so stupid i'm bad i'm an adult and i don't know how to ride a bicycle and, and that kind of thing right so here here i think is the the problem that you run into Actually, okay, let's go with a specific example. I am somebody who's spent a lot of time around gyms. Been in and out, you know, I work out sometimes off and on or whatever, but like I've been to so many different gyms. And one of the fun things about that experience is that you get to witness uh, many people showing up at the gym for the first time, trying to learn how to do things, trying to get started on a workout program, whatever. And you witness personal trainers very often you get to see their interaction with their clients now i have seen some amazing personal trainers some of them are extremely good at at working with the the particulars of an individual or working around injuries and all kinds of things sometimes they're just great but it, it is also not uncommon to see some that are maybe not so great and I think the, the biggest failing in some cases is that if you go to a personal trainer, you're going to pay them money. In some cases, kind of a lot of money. 
and you <laughs> the personal trainer needs you to walk away feeling like you spent your money well and sometimes they're they're great for motivation you know you you need somebody to kind of be on top of you and be yelling in your face and getting you to do your thing and so you do your thing right and like if that's the case then that's money well spent because you wouldn't have done it otherwise but sometimes you'll see people who go to a gym and they want to get really strong which typically the best avenue for that is powerlifting which is what i tend to do i really like powerlifting and i'm very familiar with it and i'm very familiar with the different programs and i've done it for a long time and typically and you're very strong you're that's very not what strong. i'm saying but <laughs> typically the way a powerlifting program works so you you learn the basics although again this is getting back to this tim galway example of having someone explain to you how to do a bench press is maybe not the best way to gain that knowledge and really you have to kind of do a bench press and start to become familiar with the sensations in your body and everything right but whatever setting that aside let's say you kind of learn the basics and then you go to do your powerlifting program the way most powerlifting works is you warm up you load up the barbell on one of the big lifts like a deadlift or a bench press or a squat and you do a few reps maybe three five if you're like really doing a high rep program. Sometimes it's as low as one. So you do your lift and then you sit on the ground for like six minutes and you do absolutely nothing. And then after six minutes or sometimes even longer, you get up and you do another one lift or two lifts. And then you sit on the ground and you do nothing. That's pretty much the deal with powerlifting. You just do really intense, really heavy lifts. And then you take these really long breaks. But you don't do anything and then you go back to lift. And that's powerlifting. That's that's pretty much the, the state of the art in terms of programming for powerlifting. Like you want to uh, have this really high intensity lift and then you want a lot of rest time and then you want another really high intensity lift and that's pretty much it. It's not fancy. The I have never in my life outside of going to a powerlifting gym where like it's, the, it's in the name, any other gym at the YMCA or local gyms or anything else, Anybody who wants to learn to be really strong can't because if you or if they're paying for a personal trainer, because it, <laughs> the dynamics of the personal trainer client relationship do not allow for that. You can't go in and pay somebody $80 an hour to have them tell you, OK, do three presses now sit there and do absolutely nothing for six minutes. And then when that's up, OK, do three more presses and then go back there and sit for six minutes. You don't, that does not feel like it's worth $80 and it's not like it would only take one or two sessions before the person goes, you know what? I think I can just do this on my own, but that is reality. If you're trying to get into powerlifting, you know, again, other than learning the basics, that's pretty much it. Okay. Weird tangent. Here's my point though. There's, <laughs> there's this huge pressure and attention on the transfer of knowledge from one person to another. And I think this was in Ultra Learning or, or one of those books. There's the, um, uh, the, the judgment of learning. Like, there, basically, you don't really know. You don't have some detector in your head that says, oh, I'm learning a lot right now. Or, oh, I'm getting way stronger right now. I can feel it. You, that doesn't really exist. You have to make judgments based on what you see and and other cues around you and so if you're with a personal trainer those judgments usually come from how much stuff are they telling me how much instruction are they giving me you know are they making me work really hard my perceived exertion needs to be really high i gotta be doing one thing and then supersetting with something else and then something else and like circuit training i mean almost every personal trainer you ever see will have you doing circuit training because that fits that bill of it's intense and it's fast and there's no downtime. You don't want to pay for a break. You don't want to pay to sit there and do nothing. You want to pay for somebody to be in your face, you know, motivating you or whatever. Like we have all this value and attention on the, the very visible part of the, the knowledge transfer. That's what, we, that's what we see and that's how we make those judgments of learning. And that's one of the, the key parts of the inner game of tennis. You know, Tim Galway. What he's saying, and he kind of goes through some of these examples too, is that 
there's this huge pressure for that to happen. You, know, you have the coach teaching the, the, the student. And so you expect that coach to give you a whole bunch of things that are wrong that you got to work on. Like that's, that's what you feel like you're paying for. But if you really think and observe the way we learn, you know, imagine going again, picture an adult going to a walking coach. Well, the... he uses, and I thought it was really good. He uses an example of a, a mother and her little child learning to walk, right? So it's not an adult trying to walk. It's a little kid trying to learn how to walk. Yeah. And if, if the mother stops him before he falls, like every single time says, no, 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 you know, use this leg instead or, right. or whatever. Like you're going to screw up the kid. So she sits back and even though she knows the answer, like she knows how to walk, she, she watches him fall because she knows that that's the best way for him to learn. Yeah. And so, you know, you just, you watch him and he makes mistakes and he falls and he gets back up and he just keeps doing it. And you just kind of sit back and watch and, and enjoy that almost like, you're just sort of yeah. observing this. Uh, imagine if you were an adult, again, you just got ripped out of the matrix. You don't know how to walk yet. You go, you go pay somebody $80 an hour and all they do is just nothing. They're like, okay, try it. And they're just there to like hype you up like a mother would do with her child. You know, you start walking and you fall over. And you're like, what did I do wrong? And they're like, try again. That's how you learn to walk. That's the best way to learn to walk. But you would not be okay with that. You know, if as an adult, as a thinking adult with a very developed self one, that would not feel right to you. You wouldn't want to pay somebody money for that. Well, I've also noticed, and, and the reason why all of this is bad is because it puts the focus on your self one. And it, it yes. continue. you learn to rely on self one to solve these problems or you think the answer lies in self one in, in that judgmental i don't know frustrated state of, of being like super aware of, of everything so that's where it's bad I, i've noticed with um educational material not not just teachers or whatever but books um i used to draw a little bit you know growing up and i never ever thought twice about it like i would just draw it and I never really cared about what was right or wrong. I just did it. And sometimes I would enjoy the results and other times it didn't matter. I'd just start another one or whatever. Yeah. But when I started like getting into, you know, educational material, I certainly learned a, a lot, but it also started to grow this self one attitude of, mm -hmm. and, and you can see it in the tone of the text. It's like, you know, you must draw a, or you must use this tool for this exact reason. And right. It's just, it's so, um, I won't say forceful, but it's so. It's prescriptive and it, yeah, it gives you this very strong sense of right and wrong and. It, it makes you believe that the person writing the book knows the correct way to do it, the, the right way. And if you do it and it doesn't yeah. work, you are wrong. You have failed. And that attitude shows up in a lot of my educational books. And I've always taken that as, I don't know, I've, I've taken that and applied that same seriousness to the artwork. And over the years, it has begun to become sort of crippling in, in many areas where I've tried these things for so long, but they're not working. And I just, I yeah. get more and more frustrated and I get tense and I feel like more and more of a failure the more I do it and the more it doesn't work because the books say I should do it this way. This is the right way to do it. I'm doing that and it's not working. Therefore, I'm incompetent in some way. And well, recently I've started to learn if I put the educational books away, weirdly, I have a lot of answers already. Um, and it's just, it's this matter of trusting myself, but I guess we'll, we'll get to that self too yeah. later. But, but yes, that, that attitude in, in many teachers and educational material tends to be very serious. Um, I can't, 
think of the word that I'm trying to say, but it, it's almost overbearing in its in its seriousness, and and it grows this self one, this sort of crippling attitude um, if you can't get it right. Here's what that kind of makes me think of. So I've encountered very similar things. Let's just okay back to the Starcraft example because that's my favorite thing to talk about. Um, I'll watch a pro player doing some kind of instructional video. Uh, and so they'll, you know, pretty often they'll, it'll, it'll be kind of the same where there's some particular scenario that they're talking about. Like, here's how you defend this type of attack. And it's extremely opinionated and very detailed of, okay, if they do this and you see this unit at this exact timing, then this is the optimal response. But if there's this tiny variation or you're on a different map with a two second longer rush distance, then you have to do this variation and, and so on. It's like, it's all this detail. And in, in one sense, I'm watching this and you know all the rest of us amateur players are watching this going, wow, this pro player, they know so much. And I gotta, you know, I'm like writing stuff down trying to figure out how do I follow this? And so I'm, you know, I'm playing games and I'm trying to stick with this plan that I learned from this pro player. And, you know, all the while, I'm just like, man, I, how does he know all this? This guy, he's just so good. He, he, he's got all this stuff figured out and I'm trying to do it, but it never comes out so good. And I'm clearly playing at a much lower level, but it eventually kind of hits me that in a way I'm, I'm going about it wrong. And it's, it's almost like if you, if you've ever sat, you know, God help you, if you've ever sat through a motivational speaker talk, you know, they're talking about success and how to be super rich and super successful. And it's so easy. All you got to do is follow my five steps of being ultra rich and stuff. And at some point during this horrible presentation, you start to think, well, if it's that easy to be a bajillionaire, why aren't you? Why don't you just do this thing that you're just giving away for the modest admission price that you charge to this high school, whatever. And then you realize, no, they're like, the secret here is to be a motivational speaker. The secret here is to tell people these things and that's how you make money. You know, the four hour work week isn't an instructional book on how to start a t-shirt company and be super rich. That's part of, that's one of the main thrusts of the book is like, oh, all you got to do is just sell t-shirts and you'll make a ton of money. No, the four hour work week is an example on how you make money, which is to sell people a book on how to have a four hour work week. Point is, <laughs> when I'm looking at this StarCraft Pro explaining all the intricacies and details of how to defend this particular attack, it occurs to me that he's really good and he's thought very deeply about this and he's played against this type of attack in his own games and he's analyzed it and he's understood what the fundamentals are and he's probably talked to other pros and discussed it and gotten ideas from them and talked through his own ideas and he has a very deep in some ways very simple understanding of exactly what's going on he knows he understands this attack. He understands what the opponent is doing. He understands the strengths and the weaknesses of it. He understands what needs to be done for him to, to survive the attack and be in a good position. And so once he's assembled this mental model in his head where he understands it and he's played games and he can beat it and, and you know he's doing really well with this, then he talks through all these little details that he gives to you. But He's, the, he's explaining how to walk, right? Yes. Yeah, like, exactly. Right. He's explaining how to walk. And I, I like this is no kind of criticism on him. I just think it's it's something it, that you as the viewer have to reflect upon. It's like you're getting all the outer leaves of a tree and you're like, oh, wow, this is a huge tree and there's all these tiny leaves. and There's so many. But like it really it's it's coming from something much simpler and more fundamental, which is this deep fundamental understanding of what's happening. He is playing the game. He like in order to be as good as this pro player, you can't listen to him give all these details about this attack. You have to think about it from first principles and play against it. And you have to become the type of person who could tell someone else all this level of detail about this type of attack. Like 
you can't be like him by listening to him. You have to be like him by following the same path as him. He did not learn by watching somebody else's super detailed YouTube video on how to defend this attack. He learned how to do that by doing it and by thinking on his own and reasoning from first principles. And so inevitably the problem with me just taking in all these details of his is that they're just the details. They don't come from this deep core understanding of what's really happening. And so some tiny thing changes and I don't really know what to do. Or, you know, I lose the game and I'm not really sure why. And so I can't reason about it. I can't decide, oh, you know what? Actually, this detail has a change in this particular scenario. Or I found this opponent who does this attack in a slightly different way. Like I can't make those kinds of changes because all these, this information has not come from the same place. And I think Tim Galway is talking about this um, in, at different points in the book, but he's talking about, uh, for example, you know, the, the service in how, or, you know, the, the tennis stroke, the serve, and how, you know, you, you teach a student how to do this serve and you say, okay, you know, your arms go up together and then they go down together and you want to swing your arm back here. And like, you're giving them these mechanical positions to, to flow through. And you say, this is how you do it. This is the, you know, the state of the art. This is what the pros do. Here's how you're going to serve. And so they're following the details of the serve and you're kind of learning it in this somewhat mechanical way. And one of the examples is how, I think it was Pete Sampras and some of the others around this time, because again, it's a pretty old book. Um, they, the pros, some of the pros start serving differently. And they do that because they're really good and they understand, you know, what they're after. And I want the ball to move in this direction with this kind of top spin at this angle and I need to be consistent. And so they're more than willing to play around with their, their stance and their motions and everything. And like, they aren't looking at, the even higher level pros to go, well, this is what they're doing. So that's what I got to do because they're at the top. So they can do whatever they want. Like there's none of that kind of, I need to emulate the person above me type of behavior. And so their serve evolves. And actually like, if you want to call it the meta game, like the, the meta style of service actually changed over a few years, but at the local level, pros are still teaching it exactly the same way. Right. And it takes at a while top. for it to filter down until eventually it becomes the new dogma of how to serve. Well, because at the top, there is no right and wrong. There's only right. what you want it to do. But yeah, everyone else underneath that, there's this right or wrong. Is it like the pros? Well, right. if it's not, then it's wrong. And it's not even just, it's not about the fact that this amateur player can't evolve. It, or it's, it's not, it's not so much that they need to be able to discover the new way of serving, right? Like it would be fine to serve you know, similar to the way the pros serve. The problem is that it's not being done in the same way that you're following the, it's like you're following the instructions of a recipe, but in order to be like the person, you have to be able to write the recipe. Like you have to understand why or what that's coming from and have discovered it for yourself and develop this very deep, very nuanced sensation of here's what my body does. Here's, here's why, you know, if I, flare my elbow out this is what's going to change and this is why and like it, it's just it's coming from a totally different place okay do we do we understand what self one is for the most part yeah just to sum up it's the conscious logical thought judgmental part it's it's the what you think of as you most of the time i okay i listed a couple words that he uses to kind of describe self one or or some of the aspects that come out when you're too much self one yeah. uh, judgment of right or wrong. And this is huge. Cause I, this was a big one for me is I I've started to see this a lot of, yeah. is this the right way to do it or the wrong way to do it? That means that I'm too heavy on self one and I'm not going to get it. Be okay. Uh, is it good or is it bad? Is it right? Is it wrong? Um, okay. And then a couple things that actually cause that way of thinking is by fantasizing and idealizing things. Because when you do that, you're developing that right and wrong. Yeah. Um, this gets a little strange, but you know, we're, we've been talking about what happens when you're in the moment actually doing it. Like when you're, you know, in the tennis le lesson, when you're, you know, powerlifting or whatever, or when I'm drawing, but there's so many things that happen outside of that, direct event that caused the mindset that you have when you go into it. So if I'm sitting around fantasizing about being this really great artist, then when I go sit down to do art, 
I expect myself yeah. to to be like that. I develop this right and wrong. Where is if I'm if I feel like that, then it's right. If I'm messing up, then it's wrong. And so it's like I'm training my brain to kind of to hold all of these I don't know, all of these judgments in my head when I actually go to do the thing. And that's one that's one takeaway from this book that I've had over the last few weeks, just thinking about where is it in my life that that this pattern of thinking is showing up? Where am I creating this? Like, how do I cut it off at the source? Um, we can talk about a, a couple ways that you can sort of quiet that when you're actually in the moment, but there's so many other areas where it, it sort of builds. Um, okay. Actually, I'll give an example on this because this is this is a big one for me. Uh, like two weeks ago, I'm working on this drawing and I've been working on this drawing for like, I don't know, off and on for like a month. And it was like a Saturday and I, I'm working on it for like a good four hours or something. And for the last month or so, I would run into problems in the drawing. Big deal, whatever. I go solve them. I practice whatever. I fix the problem, I move on, run into another issue, work on that, solve the problem, you know, continue on, that's drawing. Well, a couple weeks ago, I'm working on it, and I realize that I'm almost done. I'm like, I'm like 90% there, and I start feeling really, really good, like for the first time for, for that whole month. It, not just really good, I have felt good this whole time, but I start feeling really excited about the future, like, Oh my God, I'm almost done. If I finish this, I get to start on the painting. And if I finish that painting, I've done it. Like I, I finally finished my first step of my, my quest. So I've, I start getting really excited. I mean, like really excited. And, and all these fireworks go off in my head of like, oh, I could, you know, I could post it here. And then, you know, maybe for my next one, I could do this. And like all of a sudden, everything starts clicking. And I get really, really excited. Well, I, I start drawing it. I start working on it again the next day and I realize that I've made a mistake in the perspective and it like it all just comes crashing down and I become extremely upset and overwhelmed and I'm thinking oh my god like my entire future was just destroyed just crumbled to the ground um and I don't know how to fix this problem it's such a big deal I'm thinking oh my god I'm gonna have to redraw like everything it's so you know it it's this huge, massive problem. It, it's like I just did everything wrong. Like I, I had this expectation of what it needed to be, and then it was all wrong. So I start thinking, well, why am I so upset right now? I haven't felt this way since the beginning. I've been working on this thing for a month, and I haven't once been this upset about it. It's yeah. all just been this fun, playful, experimental thing until I hit the excitement. And as soon as I hit that, like, I mean, like, it's a different type of excitement. As soon as I hit that fantasizing, that idealizing, like, oh, I finally did it. I'm, you know, I'm great now and, and whatever. That screwed me up so bad the next mm -hmm. day. And it was so emotionally heavy that I, it's like I, I couldn't even think about the problem. So I busted out my, my journal and started writing it out and trying to figure out the problem. And I realized as soon as I started letting go of all of that, that stuff, the solution came instantly. I don't think that works for everything, but it's like as soon as I got rid of that right and wrong judgment, self one brain, all of a sudden the playful solution started coming to me and I was able to fix it, no problem. But I realized that the issue came from this thing that I would not normally tie uh, directly to my my quality of work it's this this weird excitement or yeah. fantasizing and idealizing that i i let kind of get out of hand and just run wild and that sort of created an influx of the the self one type of thinking and it totally screwed me up so yeah it's fun okay so i've had such similar experiences all right back to starcraft for a second there's this cycle that i've observed and i haven't understood it until more more recently where I've, after reading the book that gave me a lot of clarity here and i'm starting to see this but there's this cycle that i'll get in starcraft where you know okay so you have a skill rating right and that's 
what everybody cares about is how good am I? Here's the number that tells me how good I am. Same thing as like ELO and chess and stuff like that. So I'll be playing and let's say I'm just, I'm not playing well. And that number is just kind of slipping and I'm getting down to the bottom where I'm just playing really poorly, getting frustrated every game. It just, it's just not working. Right. And so inevitably it kind of crashes and I'll hit this point almost like a like a rock bottom of playing starcraft where i'm like man i just i can't play anymore i don't know what it is but i just suck and so usually i'll i'll go to bed after days or maybe even a week or two of this and i'll wake up and i'll say you know what forget it like i i just i don't know i just suck right now there's nothing i can do so i'm just gonna play and i'm just gonna like pick something to work on you know i'm just gonna make sure that at exactly four minutes I scout the enemy base. That's just, that's my only goal, right? So I play the game and some stuff happens. Maybe the guy attacks really early and I'm like, it's fine. I just, I don't care. I can't win anymore. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to scout it four minutes. So I'll start playing this way where I'm just, I'm not really concerned with winning or losing. Not even really looking at my skill rating. I'm just focused on this simple thing. Do this. That's the goal. That's it. Typically what happens is after a little while, I'll start to win. Sometimes I'll start to win a lot where I'll just win and win and win. And I've gone on, you know, 10, 12 game winning streaks. I'll maybe drop one game, 10 more wins. It just, it's this massive arc of winning. And it's like when you win and that number goes up, it doesn't matter how much you don't want to see it. You know that it's there and you know, it's getting better. And it's, it's almost like, it, it's like the sun. Like you can't, if you look right at it, it burns your eyes out. But it's there and it's so bright and it's just, it, like, it's, just, it's, it's so tempting. And typically what'll happen is I'll have this good mentality for maybe a few days. I go on this, this win streak. I, I might get really high, you know, up to the, you know, the peak and I'm playing, you know, top level players pros or ex-pros and streamers and everything like i'm way up there and typically you know i'll maybe i'll finish the session where I've, I've gone on this epic win streak but i'm tired i need to go to bed or i need to just quit for the day and it's like overnight the mentality just rots and it i can't it's so hard to stop but it's almost inevitable where i just start instead of thinking like i was before of forget it. I don't care about winning and losing. I'm just going to focus on these things that I want to do that. I'm, and I, I'm just going to pay attention to the game itself. I'm not going to think about how good I am or how bad I am or who I'm playing or anything. It's just all the focus is on the game in this calm, attentive, but relaxed kind of way where I'm just seeing and observing and, and going, oh, you know what? I, I was supposed to scout at four minutes and it's 4.05. So let's send that in. And you know what? I got some money floating up. So let's spend that. And like, I'm just, my full focus is on the game in this relaxed, you know, focused, but at the same time, kind of dispassionate way. Like that's the mentality, but I go on this streak and then overnight, it's like, it, I just can't keep that. It's, it just keeps twisting into you're doing really good. You got it figured out. All you got to do is be relaxed and you'll win every single game and you can beat all these people. And it, it's like, it, it's a trick. And then inevitably the next day, the day after I get on there and I just have this expectation of I'm really good now. And it, it, there's like this mental gymnastic of I'm just going to relax and focus on the stuff I'm supposed to focus on and surely I'll win every single game and be the best player in the world soon. Like that's what's in my head. And yeah, you're trying to trick yourself. Into, right. Yeah. Like you're, you're, you're lying to yourself that you've got the same mentality you did before, but it's not. And inevitably it will just crash and burn where I will like exactly the same, but opposite where it's just this, Oh, I just lost 15 games in a row and I can't play more. And then I, you know, I crash and I get it back a little bit and whatever. And then that sort of peters out. And then finally I get all frustrated again and go, I suck at this game. Let's just focus on this thing. And I, and it goes through the same cycle again. Well, God, yes. Okay. So last, I think this was last week. It doesn't matter. I get assigned to design this this room, and it was actually a really cool assignment. So, and I have about a week to do it. And I, you know, I've been reading this book and thinking about this stuff for quite a while now. So I'm 
just I'm going to apply everything to this piece. I start out and I'm just thinking, okay, no self one. I'm going to relax. I'm going to experiment. Let's just have some fun. And yeah. it works great. And so, you know, I'm doing all these thumbnails, kind of planning out this, this piece. And I'm just kind of experimenting. Like it's not, I don't have some, you know, high expectations of it, whatever. It's just, let's see what we can come up with. So, you know, a couple of days go by and I'm thinking, you know, I think this is going to be a really good idea, but I'm not really sure. And if it's not, it doesn't really matter. It's just, let's just see. And I'm just enjoying the whole process. And then th there's a shift in, in painting where you, where you do all of, or in picture making, where you do all of this prep work. And if, if you're right, like if your aim is true, it will, it will go through and it will work. But there's plenty of times where you do all this prep work and then it gets to that that turning point and then it just falls flat. So you, you're you always a little bit unsure of how it's going to turn out, which is part of the thrill of, yeah. of doing this. So it gets to that turning point and then it just lands. Like it, it really starts working. Like it's really good. And I'm really just surprised at how, how good it's looking. And that, I don't know, I, I I'm still not, I'm still not like on cloud nine. I'm not, I'm not in that state of thinking I'm so awesome. I'm just sort of in awe at how well this, this thing is looking. And I'm just kind of like in, still just enjoying this process. Well, throughout the day, people start coming up and looking at it and complimenting it, which I get an occasional compliment, you know, whatever. It's just, it's not typically part of, of your average work day there, but people kind of crowd around and I, I'm getting all these compliments from people mm -hmm. that never compliment me. And I'm, I'm thinking of my example with my, my own drawing at home and how that excitement destroyed me. And so people start complimenting me and I start getting worried. I'm like, Oh God, like this is going to make me too excited. And it's going to ruin yeah. me. And uh, so that day's over. And the next day I'm like, I'm, I'm like 15% to finish like I have just a couple things left to do if I can just hold off this stupid excitement then I can just finish and have a really good piece but I couldn't do it that um <laughs> that those compliments just screwed me up it's like and I was trying so hard to just not think about it not worry about it whatever just stave off the the ego and that way of thinking and I'm not like a cocky person I'm not like I'm not real into myself, but it still forces you to think about your identity oh. and like how you're seen and who you are and the rest of the piece, I finished it, but it's like all of that, that freedom and that exploration and that experimenting, it was gone. And I felt, I started getting really frustrated and it's like, everything was so constricted and I was so afraid of messing yeah. up my piece that you know the rest of it it's fine but it, it loses that magic that it had and so i don't really know how to combat that exactly um yeah i but so but it was cool to be able to to see the the shift of okay this this event just happened people just complimented mm -hmm. me i am at high risk of becoming too heavy on self one and sure enough that's exactly what happened um it's yeah. funny, I, I may have mentioned this in the podcast before, but one of the first things that I learned or, or discovered when I was teaching, you know, doing in-person lessons with people, is that you really don't want to compliment people. And I, I think this is a, a huge mistake that a lot of teachers make. I mean, it, it's fairly obvious now in... 2022 that you probably shouldn't say terrible things to somebody uh as a teacher right if you have a student and they're doing poorly you probably shouldn't like slap their hands with a ruler which apparently was pretty common because i had a lot of older piano students and they would go yeah my old piano teacher used to slap me whenever i messed up i would think wow that's abusive and illegal but uh it was common right whatever so like most teachers who are decent no you shouldn't insult somebody or give them like bad feedback oh, wow you're terrible you suck at this right so most of us get that but i think it is 
it is also a mistake to give somebody a compliment most of the time for that reason uh if if you're sitting there and you're working on let's you know they're they're playing a piano piece and you know you okay they were supposed to have worked on this the past week now they're playing it and they play it and you go that was great you did so well really great job you know you played it great i loved it awesome you're so good you're so amazing at piano playing then instantly they become hyper self-aware like their own you're attaching their self-worth to this piece of music that they just played and tim galway talks about this in the book how he was debating this for a while but he kind of had this little uh revelation with his students where you know they were doing something and he kind of gave them a compliment like oh you guys are you're all doing really well right now and then this whole group of of students suddenly just started doing really poorly. And the mm -hmm. reason was that suddenly they're self-aware and they're thinking, oh, we're doing great, which in some senses, it almost implies that they weren't doing great before or, or you know, they're doing good now, but why? Why am I doing good now? What did I do to have to do good now? Like it, it just ties directly into that self one where suddenly you're making analysis. And that's what it is. When you give somebody that kind of compliment, you're analyzing and you're saying, this time you did really good. You, the thinking judging you know, hyper aware version of you good job and it like it it wires directly into that and i think i i mean i'm not saying you never say nice things to people but typically when you're trying to teach somebody uh you're most often your biggest concern at least in inside the actual lesson time i mean motivating somebody to practice is kind of a separate question but you're usually your biggest concern when they're playing is trying to deal with the nervousness where they're, they feel uncomfortable. They're having to perform in front of somebody else and they're going to be analyzed. And so inevitably they're tight and they're judgmental and they're, you know, the self one is very awake. And your biggest goal as a teacher is to try to dial that back and just get them to play and like try to encourage them to just listen to what they're doing and hear it and feel it and analyze it, but not in this hyper self-aware kind of way. So the compliment thing or that I, I, even well before I had somewhat more evolved ideas on this kind of thing, that was something I recognized right away. It was sometimes the mm -hmm. worst thing you could do for somebody when you're trying to get them to relax and not be self-aware is to say, great job, you're doing really good, keep going. That'll tighten them up instantly. So he, he says that in the book that, yep. you know, negative, negative judgment or negative thinking is bad. And so is positive thinking um, because it, it does the same thing. It gets you to start thinking about what's good and what's bad. And it's, right. it gets you into that judgment mentality, which is just, it's poison to yourself too, which needs that, that objective just experiment or, or like objective exploring to just try things. And if it messes up, it just learns from it. Like if it makes a mistake, yeah. if, if you're the baby and you fall down, like you don't feel like a failure. Right. You just kind of right. work your way back up and then try another thing. You just fall the other way or, or whatever. Um, yeah. But, to okay. Me, so go ahead. No, just to me, the, the thing you're trying to get to is you want that self one or that, you know, wait, see, I messed it up. Which one is the self two is self. the inner self. Yes. You want that self too, the inner, maybe unconscious self, to be the one to uh, be able to correct and, and find errors and, and, and adjust, right? Like you want this extremely fine-tuned awareness of, okay, with the walking example, right? Like if you fall over, it's not like you want that to be completely ignored. You want to learn from right. that but you need it you you can't learn by going i suck i'm a stupid baby i'm never gonna learn how to walk all the other babies are ahead of me like you need that inner self to just recognize like oh the the weight was too far now this time we're gonna do it a little differently with the my body weights over here and like it's it's of course not in explicit terms like that it's just some sensation in, in the body but uh like that's where you need that kind of analysis to happen and when it moves into that self one it's not happening there 
Like you're analyzing and judging things on this way, way higher level of I'm good, I'm bad, I'm playing well right now, I'm playing poorly right now, uh, you know, I think I'm making the teacher happy, I'm not making the teacher happy. Like all those things are happening up here and they aren't happening down at that lower level. You become the overbearing mother who's yeah. constantly trying to tell their kid how to walk and the kid can't figure it out themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and if if you feel like if, if you start telling yourself that you suck and you're not good or whatever, every time you make a mistake, then you are only training yourself to not to try or, or not to experiment and not to take risks. Yeah. And so it's just like this, this poison. Yeah. Um, okay. So one thing that I, I started to try to do, and I'm, I'm going to try to train myself to think this way. But, but basically, if someone compliments my painting, I, I have to realize that they're complimenting self too. And I am basically not self too. Like me hearing the compliment, me thinking about it, that's self one. That, that's the, my conscious mm -hmm. mind. And the, the person that did the good work on the painting is not even really me. Like it is, but it's not my conscious self. It's myself too. I know it gets weird, but if people yeah. are complimenting me instead of, receiving the compliment in self one, I have to just like pass it off to self two and be like, thanks, I'll let them know. You know, like it's not, <laughs> right. it's not me. It's not a part of my identity. It's just, I, I know it's weird, but like that's what I'm trying to train my, my brain into doing is literally seeing me myself, seeing myself as two different uh, yeah. entities, which, you know, is a little weird. But, okay, one thing that you have to deal with is that you are self one and self two, right? And you can't make self one go away. Like, you can yeah. never really make your consciousness just go away. So what do you do with it? Um, he talks about a couple different things. And I want to hear what you think about that. But, but one thing that I've started doing is instead of, like, this is almost self three, <laughs> but if, if self one, you can't snap out of it and self one keeps judging and, and yeah. you're like, no, shut up, shut up. Don't do that. And then you're like, just go to self two. And then you hear self one judging things, whatever it, this gets pretty confusing. But what I've tried to start doing is as self one, as my conscious self, I simply just ask myself or ask self two, what do you need? You know, what, what do you need to do? your job to do the thing that you do. Yeah. Do you need me to get rid of distractions? Do you need a glass of water? <laughs> uh, you know, do, you know, do you need a little bit more practice? What do you need in order to, to do this thing? And so getting myself into this sort of like, I don't, I don't know about servant mind, but like this, yeah. this mind of what can I get you what you want? Or, or what can I get you what you need? How do I help you? How do I serve you? You know, do I need to focus on one thing? Do I need to think about a certain thing in order for you to, to take to take over? Um, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Because what do you do with self one? Because you have to do something and you right. can't just make it disappear. Right. So, OK, I, I. I actually really like the way that you're thinking about that, and it's pretty similar for me, so I'm still working on this. Uh, it, well, first off, this will be a lifelong process This, yeah. this is not going to be a solved problem at any point yes absolutely um so yeah 100 percent. i the the self one the conscious self is still vitally important and i i it there's almost this at least with with the book and what we're talking about there's almost this kind of feeling of oh self two is this holy thing and it's all that matters and stupid self one always getting in the way and like okay that's fine because that does happen a lot but you know the the mother getting her baby to walk, right? You know, she's not there saying right foot, now left foot, tighten that left quad. You know, that that's not the job. That's not what you do. And that doesn't help. But she's also not going to have her baby learn to walk in a field of broken glass or, you know, have a bunch of kitchen knives out on the ground. Like the, the environment is vitally important. You know, that baby mm -hmm. shouldn't be trying to walk next to a coffee table with some razor sharp corner or something like you. You want the baby in the right environment. And maybe, you know, that's 
on carpet instead of tile and with cushions around like you you don't want the baby injuring itself obviously but even beyond that you you know the the mom is like the hype man in some ways like she's there mm -hmm. and she's encouraging and she's happy and if the baby falls she doesn't go oh <gasps> Are you okay? Are you hurt? You must be hurt. Because, I mean, everybody knows that children react and they kind of pick up the the emotions of people they see, right? So, you know, like, there's there's all kinds of very subtle things that are very, very important that the mother does in that situation. You know, just making sure the environment is safe, making sure that, you know, the, the baby is in the right mindset. It sounds funny to say that about a baby, but it's kind of true. Like, the mother's encouraging and and helpful and, you know, all of that, right? And, and beyond that, there's... Uh, I mean, you, we don't have to only talk about the baby example. There's a video clip. I can't remember if we even brought this up before or not. No, I watched it. Okay, um, yeah. I, I don't know if we talked about it on the podcast, did we? If we did, sorry. Talk about it again. I don't okay. think you did, though. There's a video that some news agency did of Tim Galway teaching a, a tennis student. This this woman um, who had was, you know, by her own account, was very inactive, not athletic, never really did much of anything. Um, or at least not in recent decades. And so she just kind of shows up and she's going to learn how to play tennis from Till Ga Tim Galloway, but she has no confidence in herself or really anything, right? She's just kind of there. And I I'm so familiar with with this type of, of scenario and this type of person. You know, you get somebody who's, you know, middle-aged, comes in for the guitar lessons, and almost instantly they're like, you know, I, I can't carry a tune in the bucket. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I just, you know, I don't know. Somebody dared me to take guitar lessons, but I know I suck. And they're like, they've already decided that they're terrible. And so you can watch Tim Galway teaching this woman. I'm not saying she's as negative as that. Like, there's not enough video well, footage okay. to say. Before you get to him teaching her, there, there was some shots of her just, you know, hitting the, hitting the ball with the racket. You know, before the teaching, and she's yeah. you know pretty awkward with it. She's miss missing shots. She, it almost looks like she's pretending, but I mean she's not. She just has never, right. never right. done this before, and you can tell it's it's really awkward, and she's yeah. just uncomfortable with it. She's whiffing. It's hitting the corner or you know the frame of the racket and stuff. Like it's pretty bad. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Tim Galway goes to teach her, and he doesn't do any of those things that you would typically do. He doesn't say okay. Now we're learning the forehand, left foot here, right foot here, hand goes back, blah, blah, blah. None of that. Um, he says, okay, I'm going to have somebody, you know, hit balls over here. Or he has a ball machine or something like that and says, just watch me. And so he just hits some forehands and it's real simple. He's not try harding. He's just kind of hitting them and she's just sitting there watching. And he says, I want you to uh, say a couple little words as I hit it. Okay. Just this really simple rhythmic thing. So he says, when the ball bounces off the ground, say bounce. And when I hit the ball, say hit. And that's it. And so the ball's coming to him and it hits the ground and this woman says bounce. And then he hits the ball and she says hit. And he just keeps doing this. And she goes bounce, hit, bounce, hit, right? And it, I mean, it, most people would feel kind of silly doing that sort of thing. Again, back to the personal trainer thing. You want somebody saying, here's the rules, here's how you do it, here's everything that's wrong, right? Instead, this guy is just being a weirdo going, you know, bounce, hit, bounce, hit, bounce, hit, right? <laughs> And then it's her turn. And he says, okay, I want you to do the same thing. I'm going to hit the ball to you. I don't really want you to think about it much. I don't want you to, you know, be doing anything. Just say bounce when the ball hits the ground and say hit when you hit the ball. And I don't really care that much about anything else. Just do that. And so he just starts hitting it to her. And she's just going bounce, hit, bounce, hit, right? And he explains this in the book that the, the bounce hit thing is sort of a trick. It, it's... It does a couple things. One is it's a way of getting this person's mind on something other than I'm really bad at this. I'm embarrassing myself. Oh, that was a miss. I suck. I'm bad at tennis, right? Like you're you're giving them something to occupy their mind with. And then the other is that it's creating an association between what she's seeing and what she's doing. So she's seeing Tim Galway hit it. And there, it's almost like this little hook or this little cue of, you know, bounce, hit, bounce, hit. Like she, it's kind of forcing her to pay attention to what's happening and to relate that to what she's doing when she hits the ball. So she's going bounce, hit, bounce, hit, and she's imitating what she's seeing, like with these, these simple visual images and patterns and everything, right? So she's just kind of imitating the same thing and that's really it. And then he, you know, he goes to teach her the serve and he kind of does the same thing. He has like some silly, you know, okay, I'm oh, going to serve. serve. The serve was amazing because yeah, 
you know, a serve is not an easy thing. Hitting hitting a ball with a racket is pretty typical. You know, everyone kind of knows how to do that. But a serve, you know, you got to toss the ball up. You got, oh, yeah. you know, it's this overhand motion. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated. It's very and complicated. That part, it is not easy to do. It, you know, he he tells her, okay, now we're going to do the serve. And she's like, oh, no, I, you know, I don't want to do the yeah. serve. And he's like, no, no, no. He, and so he, he like, he hums this thing. And he says, well, I'm just going to teach you how to dance, but it's called the serve. You know, but it's really just a dance. And he's like, mm, pop, or something like that. Yeah, and he just yeah. like hums this weird thing, doing the motions of the serve and then hitting it. And and then he asks her, I believe, he asks her to, to hum it while he does the serve, right? So she's just humming this, mm, pop, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then he's like, okay, here, here you go. Just just go do it real quick and, you know, d- don't think about it. Just, just go do it. And then he... He like keeps her humming it, keeps her in the motion. He he doesn't let her stop and think about it. He just he keeps he keeps her going. And the first few she like you know it's total failures. Like, whatever, just just hum it, just do the yeah. dance. And she just goes through it. Before you know, it, she's just like she's just perfectly replicating him. It was it was amazing. <laughs> I like I like legitimately teared up a little watching that. I'm not even kidding. I've just I've spent so much of my life teaching and being taught. And just to me, it was so beautiful. I mean, just it really felt yeah. like the right way to have taught this person how to play tennis. And again, we'll save the teacher rant for some other day, but it's just so great. And and you know, the one of the the following scenes, and this is all within one session of like thirty. Oh, minutes they or they were. I don't even think it was thirty minutes. They they were keeping a a timer on and they're like 17 minutes in she's like you know she's getting ready to serve yeah, yeah. i mean it was like 25 or something yeah it was and, amazing and they have they they do some rally and she does like a 15 shot rally or something we're just hitting it back and forth mm-hmm. i mean I, he okay well i he pulled her straight sorry i, I just watched it like okay yeah or, it's been a, it's been a while before we started though. yeah but she's you know doing the serve for the first time after he he gets her to start serving which looked really complex and then all of a sudden she's doing this right very naturally and and enjoying it and then he just he runs to the other side of the court if i remember right and he just he starts hitting the ball back and he starts like she he just starts playing tennis with her and she's just playing and i don't know it was just so cool i can't yeah i can't even tell you how amazing that is honestly especially considering i mean this isn't you know some 17 year old overflowing with confidence who's you know right star of other sports teams right this is just somebody who's like not not athletic no faith in herself really it's so amazing to watch um okay so all right getting a little bit back on uh, or to, to try to answer this question right like what do you do with with self one so from that that video to me you could almost say that self one was like it's this woman, but it's also Tim Galway as the coach. You know, the coach is also mm-hmm. kind of the facilitator trying to get her to do what he needs her to do or what he knows she, he knows she needs to do to, to facilitate this process. So he's trying to get her to focus herself, one, on something that, like I said, is kind of double dipping. It's like doubly productive in that one, you know, she's doing this bounce hit, bounce hit, or this little funny humming thing while she serves, right? It's it's to take the focus away from the judgmental stuff. And it's also to kind of get the mind focused on what is actually happening um, in a in a way that can help you associate and like build familiarity. It's almost like a mnemonic device, right? Where, uh, you know, you you read a phone number and you got to remember it because you you have to run to the other side of the house to write it down. So you say it out loud and you keep saying it over and over. Right. That's a way of keeping Mm -hmm. that in your mind. It's kind of a similar thing here. It's. He's using that as a trick to keep this mental image in her mind while she's doing the serve. Um, so it's it's kind of these these two things. But okay, so your your self one is the facilitator. It designs the environment. Uh, it, just like you said, it, it's almost kind of trying to make sure self two is set up in the right way. Of hey, are you thirsty? Are you, you know, are you distracted? Do you feel anxious? Are you tired? Are you frustrated? You know, like the same thing that a mother would do. If you had a baby trying to learn to walk and the baby's, you know, doing this for half an hour and eventually it starts to cry and get upset, you're not going to sit there and keep 
trying to get the baby to keep going. You're like, okay, we're done. That's a good session. Let's go do something else and relax or maybe take a nap or something. Like that's what, that's that kind of judgment. And I, and I, I feel pretty strongly about this part of it too, that this, the inner self is not good at that at all. It's very, mm-hmm. very easy to just wind up in these dumpster fire modes where you can't disengage you know, you're hyper-focused, you're fatigued, you're angry, you're frustrated. Uh, and you you kind of need that rational self one to go, hey, it's probably time to go chill for a while or or something. Or, or better prevent that from really progressing to that part of the scenario anyway. Yeah, ex- yes, exactly. It It's sort of like self one sees the bigger picture. And yeah. a, a lot of times that leads to very bad ways of thinking of judging what's right or wrong right or is this gonna is is what you're doing right now going to lead to a win you know and i, I that's bad when you're trying to do something but it helps you see if you should back away or, right or right whatever some of the specifics he talks about too um well okay so just zoom in a little bit let's say you're trying to acquire a very specific skill so in tennis you're trying to develop a better forehand you know for you you're trying to you know i don't know be able to execute some particular aspect of drawing better you know i'm i don't know doing difficult things in terms of software engineering or i'm playing starcraft or lifting or something like that you know what do you do in those those smaller moments um you know, there's, there's a couple of things he talks about like the visualizations and uh observing and i think he even talks about like role play and stuff like that okay well this is the only thing that's coming to mind right now um and actually uh in our discord docs just said that uh he's he's trying to learn how to draw or something he's he's taking this course and he he just got to the ellipses part learning to draw ellipses and it he says it's kicking the shit out of him or, or something like that. Um, and, oh my God, I can relate to that so much. Because when I first started, you get to the ellipses. And, and being able to draw good ellipses is like the make or break of an artist. Like, if you can't draw good ellipses... Okay, and just for us pedestrians, that's like an oval, right? Okay, yes, but like... Okay, coffee cup, right? If you were looking at it, you know, straight on, it would be a circle, right? Yeah. But from any angle, that it's just an ellipse, right? Sure. Yes. And being able to draw those well is just extremely important um, and extremely difficult. And I remember when I was trying to learn all about ellipses, and there's a lot to know about them. Um, I would try memorizing all of these rules, and I would like map them out, and and you know, make yeah. all these little points. I don't can't really show you but it it was very complex and i'm just god they're so confusing because they they have to be these like perfect curves or or they will look wrong and your drawing will be bad um and i just remember spending so much time trying to just do good ellipses and i couldn't figure out how to do it so i don't know at, at some point it it hit me i was tracing one um i was tracing an ellipse and I don't know if this would work for everyone, but I traced it perfectly. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. If I if I try to draw this without tracing it, I can't do it. And my hand is all stiff and, and it looks awful and it's stupid and jagged and whatever. But I can trace it perfectly, which means that it's all in my head. Like my hand can do the motion. Like I, I understand how to do that if I know exactly what it is. But something is happening in my mind where I I I don't know what that is. Like I can't yeah. picture it. So I started just tracing them over and over and over again and trying to get like the the mental image of that that ellipse. And it was this totally different feeling from being all constricted trying to do it the right way and I was always doing it the wrong way. It was this super judgmental thing switching to this like free flowing like experimental having fun with ellipses committing it to memory and and just doing it it was really fun it turned into this like experimental thing where i didn't see i'm sure it's in some book somewhere but i didn't read in a book that you should trace them i just found it and i started experimenting with it it 
it probably wouldn't make sense to everyone, but for some reason it worked for me. And that attitude of, oh, let me just follow this interesting, you know, rabbit trail. Let me just explore. Let me just have fun. And then I'm seeing how it's working. And, and I don't know, it was just this, it was, a, it was amazing. It was fun. It went from being horrible to, to really fun. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're trying to learn a new skill, you need to have that, that playful mentality of, you know, if I'm trying all the stuff from the books or what my teacher is saying and it's not working, well, yeah. well then I'm doing it wrong. Uh, maybe don't use the word wrong, but <laughs> tr try some other, it, it, you know, come up with your own ways and, and see what works. Start playing around with stuff and stop trying to do it the, the right or the wrong way. You just Try to see what works for you. And you can look f look into the instructional material for clues, you know, to stay on the right path or to know you're in the right, the right place. But don't use that um, so literally. I, I was yeah. using it very literally. Um, it reminds me of when I used to teach piano a lot. A lot of times you would, you know, you have a student, you you're, want them to do something pretty simple, right? Just, just play some basic chord on the piano or maybe this little interval or something so their thumb has to press this key and their you know pinky has to press this key or something like that and it's it's objectively it is not hard to do i mean you can you can place your fingers on the keys and you can press them and anyone can do that it's a very very basic motion you just you just put your hand there and you press the keys right and sometimes you'd have somebody and this it was more common in younger kids where they would just they would just do it like you would say hey can you do this and they go okay and they do that and that was it right like they just they just put their hand there and they press the keys but other times and it's not always the case but often more common in older people you know adults they would like they it's like they expect it to be difficult and so mm -hmm. it's it becomes difficult like their their hand is tight they're like stretching and cramping and they you know they do it but they're hitting another key because this finger's like you know twisted around and pressing it like it it genuinely is a very easy thing to do but they can't do it because they're just they're so tight and they're it's like they in their mind it's hard because playing piano must be hard and of course it can be hard you know you can do very difficult things but you know this particular part is not and so in their mind it must be hard and so they're like coming to meet that with all this effort and analysis and judgment and like, Oh, I'm going to do it right this time. And like, you can just watch their hand contort and, and they, their, their wrist is tied and pushed down and all kinds of things go wrong. And it, I don't know. It's just funny that they, they expect it to be hard. And so it is hard and they struggle to do it. And sometimes you have to spend a lot of time trying to get them to relax. And it's it's like this, you can't get them to accept that all they gotta do is just put their hand there and press the keys. And I'll try to explain to them like, you type on a keyboard, right? In front of your computer? Like, oh yeah, that's different though. And I'm like, no, it's not. You just <laughs> right. don't think it's hard. You can press buttons on that keyboard. You can so press buttons on this keyboard. It becomes so difficult to do. So what would you do? I, I mean, well, okay. Say, say someone asked you to do that. And for some reason you didn't have any piano knowledge and your hand was all tensed up and you realized, okay, well, this is the wrong way to do it. What would the right way to do it be? I mean, it, you know, like what's the mentality that you should have? Well, if okay, you are so, an adult, yeah, you know, I'm not sure exactly. I think at, at a minimum, just assume that everything's gonna be really easy not like okay you could sort of take that the wrong way but you know if, if you watch your piano teacher put their hand on the keys and and press the keys and you look at that and you go well it didn't look hard you know they just put their hand out and they press it they're like why could they do that but not you you know you have the same hands right. you have the same brain stem you know, you're, you're going to have to learn, you're going to have to try things and adapt, but you know, that simple motion that looks very simple for them, it might actually just be very simple. So just try doing it in a very simple way. Well, one thing he says, which would be, it's very easy to miss, 
or to just kind of write off because you've heard it so many times but he says learn to trust the self too yeah which as an adult you don't want to trust self too or your 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 instinctual abilities because it's so important to you as an adult that you don't look like an idiot yeah we've talked about this before like we are obsessed as adults with always looking good or, or always looking like we're competent in some way unlike children who who could could care less so he he says to learn to trust your mm-hmm. self too which is that's that's what i'm trying to to head towards is to in any new endeavor i want to trust the fact and sort of believe because it's kind of true that i already know how to do it um Oh man, I remember Steve Vai talking about that at, at some point. That you know, every finger movement on on your guitar that you could possibly do, you already know how to do, yeah. and it's only a matter of learning what you already know how to do. It's this weird knowingness, like you you already know this stuff, and you have to practicing is less about learning new things from the outside world and much more about allowing it to happen with you already, which. It sounds weird, but it's true. And with, you know, with the piano, they already know how to do their hand like that. The problem is that they they don't trust themselves to do their hand like that. So they they overthink it and they start, you know, explaining how to walk or, or whatever. And there goes your lights again. Um, but as adults, we stop trusting that, that self too. And we rely on the, the self one the the ego the this judgment oriented way of thinking and it cripples us and it makes us tighten up and of course we can't do it then um i was i was with our nieces uh like last week and i'm they're are they seven they're like seven and i don't know five, why you would eight try and to... six damn it i don't know they're they're like seven years old the average seven years old less or minus two years right yeah. and uh they're always older than i I think they are, but anyway, I'm I'm sitting there with our other brother, and we're just having this conversation. We're just talking. You know, he says something, then I think for a second, and then I say something. You know, we're both sitting, you know, like proper adults, yeah. whatever, drinking our coffee, you know, formal conversation, semi-formal. Um, and then the nieces are in front of us. They're just, like, doing cartwheels and, like, dancing around and, like, impersonating i don't know some strange character they saw on tv at some point you know in the recent past and they're just like they're going through all these voices and while they're like telling us stories and (laughs) they're just they're going all over their place all over the place there there is no self one with them that it's just not even in the in the equation they're just pure self two they're doing what whatever just comes up they're experimenting exploring like just having fun and and Man, I was just watching that, thinking like the, the contrast of, you know, I want to sit here, I don't want to do anything goofy, whatever, and then you know my nieces are there just going crazy as as children do, yeah, and um, yeah, it, I don't believe that we're forced to do that, that that we are forced to be like this adult thing that can no longer be childlike in in certain activities. Be, especially because recently like in the last few months we've been focused on on this type of thing and i've seen real changes where if i can get rid of that self one that way of thinking weird things start to happen like incredible things happen stuff that i didn't even know i could do but turns out i, I can do um yeah yeah <laughs> i i don't really have a lot to add to that i Totally agree. Um, so, so I guess my point is, learn to trust that you can do these things. Um, so w- when I sit down to draw or to to work on a piece or whatever, I'm I'm trying really hard um, to just trust and, and just relax and and just see what happens instead of trying to force this you know level of quality that I I I want from myself. I'm just trying to to let go. And just trust the the self too. Here, okay, a couple quick thoughts on that. So for one, 
sticking with music for a minute. Um, we've talked a little bit about this before, but you know, music can be approached in a few different ways, and and one of them is a very you know athletic way where you're trying to be a performer and you're performing other people's music. You know, if you want to be a concert pianist, you're trying to play at the absolute highest level. So it is in some sense like an athletic performance in that way. But if you're trying to create music, which I think is what a lot of people are interested in, you just, you want to make your own music and and share it with the world, right? Pretty much by by definition, like you you have to write a song that doesn't exist or else it's, you know, copyright infringement and you're just stealing someone else's work. So the only way you get there is by by discovering and finding things that are new. And that of course is a exploratory childlike process. That's the, you know, the self to just playing around, discovering new things and, and evolving that way. And I, I mean, I have no formula to be a great musician, but I can guarantee if you're overwhelmed with judgment and self-analysis, you will not be a great musician. Like you, again, back to my favorite quote, good music comes from people who are relaxed. Like you have to be just in that mindset. So if you want to be a great musician and you want to discover and, and explore new areas, then like that's your goal is to discover and explore new areas and, you know, not be reading about how exactly you do something according to this person or that person or, you know, according to Michael News and music theory, whatever. You got to just find and explore. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the way to, to approach that stuff. Just to get into some kind of specific stuff in the book, you know, Tim Galway acknowledges how difficult it really is to be in that mindset. And I can tell you from having been yes. trying to do it over the past many weeks, very, very hard. Your mind doesn't just shut off. Uh, and you, you might have windows where you feel great and you feel like, you know, self too is just exploring and your judgment is turned off. But again, inevitably, sometimes even after the fact that that mind starts yeah. going. Right. So a couple of things that he, he specifically brings up, um, for, for tennis, he, uh, talks about focusing on the ball, right? And he says, it's not because you hear that all the time. You go take any tennis lesson anywhere. The coach like, focus on the ball, eyes on the ball, eyes on the ball. And it's exactly one of those things that you just kind of hear and don't actually do. Uh, because it's very much a self one thing, right? So he says, try and see like the texture of the seams on the ball. Like, don't just take it as this sort of, you know, eat your vegetables, don't drive too fast type of advice, like actually genuinely try to see the ball, like the, the subtleties, the fuzz, the spin, everything. Give your yourself one, give yourself one something specific to do. Oh, this is weird because you're on the other side now. Fix so, your video. I'm here, I'm here. I'm okay, excited. so I've tried to apply that kind of, uh, you know, focus technique to, to certain things like, you know, whatever, playing StarCraft or something. And it actually... It, it feels wrong at first to, to sit there and really try to focus your mind on something like that because you feel like you're, you're having to give up that self one where you want your self one brain to be, you know, thinking and analyzing and doing all that stuff. And if you're really sitting there, you know, focusing on the texture of the ball or paying attention to some subtle thing, it's a little bit anxiety inducing at first, at least it was for me because it feels like oh, I can't focus on this. I got to focus on all the other stuff. I got to let my self one be in charge and be thinking and analyzing and everything. But the results are really good. Um, the times that I'm really been able to do that, it, it typically winds up to me performing a lot better than I was before. I was listening to this artist on, on the show and he was talking about how some of the the absolute best uh, inkers, you know, ink drawing artists um, that do this these like extremely elaborate, gorgeous ink drawings where there's just you know millions of, of lines everywhere. He said it it's not so much that that they 
you know, love art more than anyone else or that they work harder than anyone else. He said, he said it, it might just be as simple as the fact that they love um, the tactile feeling of, of the pen scratching across the page. And he said, if, if you look, if you look at, at what they do in, in their free time or, or their, what their interests are, is that a lot of them are just obsessed with, with pens and types of inks and paper. Like their obsession is, is for these tiny little things. Like when you yeah. think extremely, you know, prolific artist or whatever, you think, you know, they're, their brain just works 10 times faster than other people and they can, I don't know, they just work harder or whatever, but it could be as simple as that they just love that the feeling of the pen on the paper and, and what the yeah. ink looks like when it comes out. Like it's so simple, but it, it is enough. Now I'm just drawing conclusions here, but this was a theory is that it's enough to just keep that self one focused and engaged on this one thing. And it allows you to kind of let everything else yeah sort of come into play not that that's the secret well to but anything, it might, but i have a lot to do with that um one of the other okay so i want to get through a couple specific things that he recommends um just so we can kind of like have that out there so there's the one trying to to draw your mind into this very specific focus like focusing on the fuzz of the tennis ball um, or in that example of him teaching, you know, doing the, the humming or the bounce hit or something like that. You're giving yourself a thing to focus on. Um, and actually, I, if I can find this, I'll link it. I know that everyone says they'll put stuff in the show notes that I never do. But there's some study that I came across a while ago where they were testing basically this of, of cueing people's focus to some specific thing while they're learning. And they found that they learn better. And I, I, I can't exactly remember the details, but it was right along those lines. And they found that it really didn't matter that much what the thing was. If you got somebody's focus on something specific while they're learning, as long as it was, you know, related to that thing in some way, they learned better. And they had no real explanation for it that I can remember. But it very much fits in with what Tim Galway is saying is to occupy that judgmental mind, give it something to, to focus on and let that self to, you know, do its thing. So uh, hopefully I can find that. And if anybody else knows this very vague thing that I'm talking about, please let me know. Um, okay, so another thing that uh, he brings up is kind of this, we talked about this a little bit ago, the, the information transfer process and how if you have one human teaching another human, you know, the, the tendency is to to talk and say words and, and explicit knowledge type stuff. And in many cases, that's not the right thing. But that, you know, we're, we're trying to move knowledge from one place to another. So how else would you do it? Uh, and, and this can be the same as if you're teaching yourself or reading a book or anything. So one thing that he talks about is visualization um, or, or, well, he kind of separates this into two things. There's imagery, which, you know, is you watching someone do the thing that you're trying to do. And, and I think you would do exactly what he did when he's teaching this woman is try and create almost these mnemonics of, you know, hum it, say it you know, close your eyes and picture it, do something to try and get your mind engaged in the thing that you're actually seeing, and then try and, you know, bring up those memories and things as you're trying to imitate the thing that you're doing. But it's not, it's not a bunch of explicit knowledge. It's, you're not watching a tennis player swing and go, okay, he's got his racket slightly above shoulder height, you know, with, at this angle, and then he brings it down at this speed. And like, you can't, you can't capture that in explicit words, but you can capture it in images and these, you know, a video sequence in your brain. And then you take that and try and just imitate that with your own play. So that's, you know, and of course you could do that with art or with something else, right? There's also visualization, which I think is really similar, but, you know, say you just, you feel like you aren't doing something the way you think it ought to be done rather than sit there and go, oh, get your racket up, you know, do this thing. Like you're not, you can't command yourself in explicit commands, but you can sit there and close your eyes and visualize the way you think it ought to look and like create that video image in your head and then do it and, and just try to imitate that, that image that you're seeing, you know, the, the visualization of what you want or even visualizing an outcome. You know, he talks about, you know, hitting a ball deep in the court rather than telling yourself, hit it deep, hit it deep. Just picture it going deep, like create this, this objective in your mind and then sit there and just without judgment or anything, just try and, and mimic that 
that thing that you have in your mind. Um, but, you know, there, there's this communication layer from self one to self two of, you know, it, it's, it doesn't happen in explicit commands because again, these things are not a series of logical, you know, capturable events. They're, they're images, their feelings or sensations. And so talk that way, you know, just use these images and visualizations. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a great piece of insight. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, he says he was doing some kind of drill. He's like, you know, if, I don't know, some sort of overhand swing and you want to hit this specific part of the tennis court, whatever. But he's he's saying visualize, you know, you doing it. Imagine the results you want. You know, which, which sounds very uh, motivational yeah. or, or whatever. He says, but imagine exactly what that feels like, what it looks like, and then just ask yourself to to do whatever it takes to make that happen. And don't overthink it. Don't don't try to control it. Whatever you just just try it. You know, just ask yourself to trust the fact that you already know how to do this, and then just do it. Which is is not easy. But that's the feeling you want to have yeah. is, OK, this is th this is the thing I want. Trust yourself to just do it. Um, it I almost, OK, I so think of it. Well, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Just, I, I, I almost picture a uh, like a director on a set talking to an actor. Say they have this this actor that's awesome and super talented and they know that this actor can do, you know, just anything they throw at him. They just totally trust this person. And so if the actor isn't delivering in the right way. You know, they get on there and say, here's what I want from you. Picture you're in pain and, the, the, you know, you've lost the love of your life. And like, you're, you're so upset and like, you're just demonstrating to them. Here's what we want. The assumption isn't, oh, you're a bad actor. I bet you can't really do this. You know, they're not commanding him like that sucked. You're terrible. You know, you, you, you should quit. They're more just communicating in, no, 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 this is what we want. Picture this. And you're just trying to communicate in this almost visionary kind of way of like this is mm -hmm. what we want so you're on the tennis court and you want your shot to go deep don't sit there and go you suck you're stupid you've been trying to do this for weeks and you still can't get it it's like no no no. this is what we want picture this and talk to the that self too that way and again it sounds hokey and weird but the more i've tried it the more i think yeah this actually makes a whole lot of sense no i remember i used to play in this band uh, when I was in, in high school or something. And, you know, every week we would play. And throughout the week, I would listen to new, you know, guitarists. I, I specifically one time remember, but I would do this all the time. I was listening to Stevie, Stevie Ray Vaughan a lot. And I remember when it was my turn to play and I'm like, you know, uh, just improving. I'm just thinking, I want that feeling of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. You know, I, I can't explain it. It's like trying to explain the walk. I can't do that. But I can think of, I can feel the feeling of Stevie Ray Vaughan, and I know what that feels like. And without thinking about specific notes or, you know, real specific music theory mm -hmm. or whatever, I mean, you know, I have this roadmap in my head, but like, I just remember being able to like impersonate Stevie Ray Vaughan w without playing, you know, exact riffs of his or whatever. I just, right. I remember thinking the feeling and then just playing the feeling. And, and it worked like that. Whereas, as you know, nowadays I'm like, oh, well, I got to learn this exact theory. I got to watch right. that Michael New YouTube video and memorize that. And, you know, uh, not that that's, you know, that's, that's not what I meant. That's great. But, <laughs> but, you know, thinking of a feeling is not something that you typically think right. to do, but that's something that really worked for me. Yeah. Um, okay. Actually, so. Two things. One, he talks about that specifically. He calls it a uh, role play or, or imitation or something. He he kind of has this example of uh, imagine you're playing tennis and, you know, he put the camera on you and he said, OK, for this shot, the only thing that matters is that you look like a professional tennis player. You know, we're not going to shoot where the ball's going. You're not even going to see anything. I don't care if it hits the fence or the net or whatever. You just have to look like you're a pro player with complete confidence and just you're totally fluid. You're comfortable. You've been doing this for decades. That's all we want. And so just, just do that again. Absolutely doesn't matter where the ball goes. We're not even going to see that. So this person just sits there and like has to pretend that they're, you know, ultra confident and everything. And actually that seems to work really well in getting someone to actually play well. And so to go back to your question about the piano thing, right? Like if you were this person who's, you know, 
you're one of the bad students in my mind where you try to go right. to do this thing and you're super tight. Just pretend just for fun that you're an amazing piano player and you can just do this. And so you're less concerned with what your fingers actually do. And you're more concerned with just looking like you're totally confident, super relaxed. You barely even paying attention. You just put your hand out and press the key. I think that's exactly what would work beautifully in that scenario is just pretend that you're good. And forget about what actually happens. And I bet you would get to a very relaxed, comfortable way to play. And, you know, no, exactly. It will, just last week, I'm I'm working on this piece, and and the one that was that was working really well and and coming along great. Yeah. I get to this this one area, and it's like this it's sort of like this half dome sort of thing with these designs all over it and whatever. And I'm just. I'm completely relying on myself too. I'm just drawing like what feels right and whatever. And it as aesthetically, like it, it looks really good. Um, but I realize, like while I'm doing it, that I'm impersonating something that, that, that there is something coming through that I've seen before, not, not directly, but the feeling that I'm going for, just like the Stevie Ray Vaughan feeling. It's like, there is this feeling, this, this look that I want that that's coming across. And I'm just sort of like, impersonating and i realize that it's sid mead uh one of my favorite illustrators i watched this dvd this dvd where he paints something sort of similar to that and i realized even though i watched this years ago um hmm. i'm like impersonating that that feeling that that he gave me just by watching him paint and it uh it was fantastic um that's cool so i just you know that's not something I, I read in a book it's it wasn't the series of rules it was this i don't know this feeling impersonation of, of something that i'd seen before so yeah and it's funny because in a way you know that's when what you're walking, creating that you know that's how you learn how to walk you impersonate things yeah yeah that's how you learn how to talk <laughs> and it i mean it if you're an artist and you're creating a piece of art I mean, I, we were just talking before we started recording about AI and, and how it can just kind of create things and crank them out. Like, if okay, anybody can, or not anybody, if you, if you wanted a painting done in a certain way, you could get that done. You could say, I want this object in this place and with this setting and whatever. But the only art that anyone really cares about is one that evokes some kind of feeling where you see it and you just go, wow. I love this for reasons I can't fully articulate, right? Like at the end of the day, you're trying to communicate a feeling. I mean, is that mm -hmm. yeah. roughly yeah. fair, right? Yeah, so it, in a sense, if you're gonna be a good artist, that's what you do. That's what you have to be good at is taking a feeling and communicating that to somebody else. And I think that absolutely applies for music and really all forms of art, right? Like you're trying to communicate feelings to, to another person. Yeah. I mean, even if it's architecture or landscape yeah, right, or whatever, right, it's, still, whatever. Uh, your commun it's a language. I mean, it's absolutely a language. And you learn to speak this language by watching your art parents <laughs> and yeah. mimicking them. And I forget this so often, but anything good that I've done, I I'm not copying them, but I'm impersonating them. And I I'm right. mimicking some of their behaviors and, and what what they see in in things. And I have one, okay, one of the biggest and, and coolest statements I, I think he said. Ah, man, this book was so good. It There's really so was. much good stuff in it. Um, ah, he talks about competition and why he used to think that was really bad. And then he totally changed his mind. Mm. Um, do you remember that section yeah, about the Yeah, actually, surfing? I'm glad you brought that up because I had some thoughts on this too. Explain that because... Well, I don't remember it that well, but he's basically saying how he was having... A discussion with his dad i think or something like that but basically you know there was this he had this perspective of no it's you know it's it's not about the opponent at all you're just trying to connect with your inner self and and play and and explore and just you know you, you know winning and losing shouldn't matter at all it can't matter and then after talking about it more and he eventually decided no no, no actually it's really important um you know it's it's the job of your opponent to to push you as hard as they can and present you with this this new hurdle or this unique challenge that you have to overcome and so it, it's like 
it's a stimulus to your yourself and your skill and your inner self and everything and like it's part of what helps you develop and so i, I don't know if that's a fair summary of what well, he's saying or not somehow the dad was saying they got into an argument about surfers like are they do they compete or yeah. or are they just surfing because they they sit out there and they wait for the biggest wave and then they ride that wave and it was like this well are they competing or are they not competing you know whatever um but i i guess he sort of realized that that challenge of finding the absolute biggest wave is where you where you you demonstrate your peak performance that's where you experience your yourself to in in its peak or at its max is yeah. with the biggest challenge um and if you overcome that then you have reached you know new heights you've experienced this this new thing and so you know the surfers look for the biggest wave and in a competition what you're actually doing is trying to give like the biggest wave to your opponent so they can experience that so so they can yeah. reach new heights like you're actually doing them a favor by giving them this immense challenge and so it's this back and forth of throwing um throwing challenges at each other in order to like build this wave bigger and i just thought that was such a cool way of thinking about it um but one one thing he says just kind of related to that he says most people use use focus or this whole idea of focusing to improve a skill he says but that's so backwards you should use your skills to improve your focus like as a person and so um it, well you can't say focus in two different contexts for this but your your focus totally changes to where you're not so concerned with an outcome uh, in the immediate moment like you're not so concerned with winning your starcraft game what you're concerned about is is feeling that that experience of of doing a really good job or playing the game yeah. really well so you're using this skill to build your focus and and your your focus and that experience and that um that demonstration of of self too is like what life is about i mean I don't know. It can get kind of weird, but I just thought that was such a cool way of thinking yeah. about it is using all of these different things that we want to be really good at, you know, like like art or Starcraft or whatever it is. It doesn't even really matter what it is. The reason why we all care about it so much is because it, it, it improves that experience. When you do it really well, that self too is so involved that that yeah. natural ability that innate experience i don't know the human experience like that's what it's about and so you use the skills to build that not the other way around and i i think that in some ways that kind of explains some of the people who just seem to be really good at almost anything like even really unrelated stuff i, I so one of the earliest things we talked about was i hope i remember his name right josh waitskin uh yeah. okay and right. he <laughs> he was a chess player really high level chess player um but at, at some point he he kind of decided to give up the game because it just it wasn't really making him happy and from there he got into push hands i think is what it's called it's like a form of tai chi hope i'm getting this right because it's like <laughs> the whole point of the book he went from chess to a martial art which you know is about as different as you get at least you know on the surface right um and he he won the world championship at, at push hands which is like this you're you're like it's almost like sumo wrestling except they aren't huge they're just kind of trying to manipulate each other and push somebody out of a circle and whatever right but if you listen to the way he talks or, or the way he he writes about this i th i think th this sort of this model for it of the self one and the self two is such a great explanation. I think it fits him perfectly in that, you know, he's just fully invested in, in chess when he's talking about chess. It's just like an obsession. It's pure. It's simple. He's, you know, it, it's, it, there's the self one awareness, but there's also the self two 
very much so of just full involvement and that that discovery and playfulness and exploration and everything and then when he talks about push hands he's talking about the same thing like how he just explores all these feelings in his body and he's just trying to like develop this sense of the tiniest most subtle things and just to me he fits that description perfectly of somebody who has this really amazing balance and connection between these two different selves and i think i think that explains him and people like him so well especially when you consider the difference between those two things right the chess and the you know tai chi it's so so wildly different you know one right. is purely physical and based on reflexes and strength and everything and the other is like you know what most people would consider it's all in your brain and thinking and calculations it's totally different and so you you can't argue genetics with that i don't think that can make any sense in any way like he's just i just think he has the right the right mental approach and i i i really feel like if we could all at least move the needle and hopefully just just develop that that connection between these two selves and really allowing you know self to to come out at the right times in the right environment and to be encouraged and allowed to do what it does and then also to understand the role of self one we could just be so much better at so many things not just the the stuff that we're focused on right now but everything else and it develops your focus and develops all these aspects of you that are just applicable everywhere for for all kinds of things I, that is such a, a wonderful and exciting idea to me let's end with that i i love that and i i can't think of anything more important than just thinking about that yeah honestly read the book it's really short it's really good. It's super easy to read. There's an audio book um, that you can get. It's pretty inexpensive. It was, actually was a little bit hard to find the book for me, but you know you can order it from Evil Amazon or whatever. But it's it's really really good. And there's so much more in it too. Yeah. Um, we. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this this felt like a very long one, but we were both just really excited about this book. So I hope hope something came across. All right. Thanks everybody for sticking it out um again go check out the book um if you're on a podcast platform uh we would love any reviews you have or come i think you actually can leave comments on apple Podcasts. i learned that recently so we'd love to hear your thoughts there uh you can email us at the overanalyzers podcast at gmail.com you can leave comments on our youtube channel and we keep up with all of those different avenues um you can support the show if you believe in what we're doing and we we absolutely very much appreciate everyone who's done that. So thank you so much. Um, we do have some merch for sale if you're interested in a whiskey glass or a uh, coaster. So, uh, and more to come, maybe. All right. Thanks for listening. See you in a week.